this room for a All right, next up we have Sarah Bell. Sarah Bell started professionally mapping 10 years ago, mapping for the National Park Service at Mount Rainier's Climbing Division. She's currently working as a cartographer and data visualization designer at Esri. Um, she lives in Bellingham, Washington, and also Kentucky um, part of the year. She enjoys rock climbing, running in both places. Um, she's also been involved in GIS remote sensing for about 10 years. Academically, she's grown up at the University of Kentucky in Clark University. Uh, no, had that's, a that's Jacob. <laughs> Jacob has been involved in GIS and remote sensing for about 10 years. Sorry about that. Um, academically, I, uh, he's grown up at the University of Kentucky, Kentucky and Clark University. Had a summer stint at Oregon State um, in their cartography and geo visualization group. Um, these days, he works as a web developer at Esri and enjoys traveling um, while also trying to hide the fact that he sometimes acts like a total food snob. So enjoy their presentation, and um, we'll keep going. All right. Hello. Um, I'm happy to be back, to be back at NASIS. Uh, so Jacob and I met about two and a half years ago, and we quickly became map collaboration buddies. And so we're going to share some of the stuff we've created. Today we're going to be talking about flow mapping. In particular, we're going to share how some dissatisfaction with dynamic flow mapping led to our method of mapping Bezier curves to the HTML canvas using JavaScript. So a little bit of background about that. Clients were giving me a lot of requests to map the flow of their data, and I quickly began to notice, um, after a couple of these requests, a pattern of uh, affiliated requirements. And it didn't really matter what their data set was, because a flow map can map anything from the flow of phone calls to the flow of funds to a political candidate, or even the flow of something abstract like ideas from one part of the world to another. Some of those requirements were that flow maps needed start and end points. Um, even if you're not putting the start and end point on the map, the flow of the spatial phenomenon in a flow map needs to start somewhere and end somewhere that is probably different from where it started. And of course, it's vital in dynamic and static flow mapping to show the flow between the start and end points, and this illustration of flow will uh, incorporate directional relationships and magnitude. And not always, but quite frequently, um, a global data set is characteristic of a dynamic flow map. At least that's what we were finding. And we also incorporated uh, temporal data into our uh, flow mapping applications. And we also made some applications, um, prototypes, that in, uh, showed the disruption of flow and leading to the final thing. We needed to solve these disruptions by identifying points in the system that were similar enough to the non-operational points to be able to pick up the slack of the disruption of flow. And so, like I said, we had to think of all those things when we were in making these Bezier curve canvas flow map layers. Um, but today, we're just going to talk about the flow between the start and end points. So Dr. Bernhard Jenny, in his recent Cages article on flow maps, has a really great description of, of what a flow map is. He defines them as maps that visualize movement using a static image and demonstrate not only which places have been affected by movement, but also the direction and volume of movement. And of course, a lot of you in the room are making static and dynamic maps, um, and those dynamic maps add some of those challenges we just talked about. And his paper goes on to say that there are no strict rules in, in uh, flow mapping. So anytime you and I see a flow map, what we're seeing are maps that are largely based on expert intuition and aesthetic considerations. And I personally love having these areas where you can test and experiment um, where there are no strict rules, but I do also embrace the bounds of great cartographic rules. But I really do appreciate being part of a field like cartography where you can test and experiment new solutions without the dread of being publicly branded a rule violator. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so this um, geodesic lines are a very common way to do dynamic flow mapping. And this is a map I made of phone calls, a phone call data set. And I'm using geodesic lines because it was the immediate solution that I had access to. And honestly, my client liked it, but I didn't. So let's all step back for a moment. This is a good crowd to do this. And consider that maps are abstractions. And it's that abstract quality of maps which makes them so incredibly powerful. It doesn't do anybody any favors to view the actual arc of the planet between a phone call's origin and the receiver of that phone call. So I was dissatisfied with this, and I tried straight lines as well, and that was equally dissatisfying. Um, and I kept thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so 
Finally, I had the idea of using a consistent curve formula that each path could take, kind of in fractal geometry, where each individual path held its own meaning, but as a whole, they would appear cohesive and appealing. And this was the very beginning of my campaign for using Bezier curves for flow mapping. And so what does that look like? So here's the result of that concept. Uh, what we're looking at is the same point data set we were previously looking at, but now I'm using a consistent Bezier curve formula for each line. And this map is a lot cleaner. It's more like a symphony of lines that work together rather than the harsh cacophony that we were previously viewing. And so have, with this large data set, having all the lines on, so to speak, can, you know, you, you want to find out what's going on at each individual point and their connected points. So in the canvas flow map layer, which Jacob is about to show you, we give you the option to isolate points by clicking or hovering on them. So now turning it over to Jacob, he's going to share with you um, our GitHub repo and how you can make this canvas flow map layer your own. And then we're going to close with some samples. Uh, if we don't have time to show the samples, please come find us afterwards because we have samples that people have taken the canvas flow map layer and um, done stuff with it in the wild. All right, turning it over to Jacob. It's, that's my screensaver. <laughs> oh, here we go. Maybe then you can't see it. Oh, no. I pull it back. Did you touch anything? Function of seven. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so, let's get the side panel off here. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, my role today is to be uh, Sarah's hype man. I've got some demos for you and to show you how we took these ideas and uh, brought them brought them to life, uh, made them dynamic. So, what I'm showing you right now is uh, our open source GitHub repository uh, for the Canvas Lab layer. And what this particular repo does, which is at cerebellum slash canvas flow map layer. Uh, its purpose is to give you a layer plugin, like third party layer plugin. The third party layer plugin for uh, the Esri ArcGIS API for JavaScript. We also have um, sort of a sister repository for Leaflet.js too. So they, they share a very similar code base. It's all written in JavaScript. And for uh, both of these repositories, we have uh, quite a bit of documentation that we put time into, including sort of long form uh, discussions, uh, demonstration pages, samples, so you can sort of see what it does yourself and to see if you might want to use it on your own projects, as well as uh, more technical developer documentation. So those two uh, repos are, as I mentioned, cerebellum slash so canvas flow map layer and uh, over here under leaflet canvas flow map layer. So I'll go ahead and dive into a, a live sample. Uh, this is the Canvas flow map layer that works on top of the Esri ArcGIS API for JavaScript. And we have this concept of origin and destination points as well as the actual Bezier curves. Um, so in here we just happen to style there are origin points as these like green, yellow kind of, kind of dots and our destinations as blue. So in this case our data is structured as a, as a one destination to many uh, many origins, that's why you sort of have many lines coming out of Reykjavik. Uh, we've also added animation. It's totally optional if you want to use it or not, but uh, we thought it could be a good, if anything, a good visual reference for people who are maybe are users or anyone who's sort of seeing this for the first time. And right now, I've only, we've only flagged Reykjavik and its 
and its many destinations as the one thing that we, the, the one kind of relationship that we want to highlight and show at this moment. Of course, you can uh, click on some other spot and sort of tell the layer that that's what you want. So what we're doing here is we're actually taking the, the origin and destination points which you provide when you use this and actually lifting them up out of the web map, out of the GIS coordinates, and into uh, a, a browser canvas element. So now we're actually dealing just in like browser pixel space. And the canvas actually has a built-in method for drawing busy curves. So that's why every time I zoom and every time I pan, we're redrawing and we're retelling the canvas to lift these points up out of the actual spatial coordinates and bring them into the browser canvas element. So with that, I think I'll flip over to another sample that we have. In this case, it's actually built on top of leaflet.js, and we've sort of built this big widget on the side that's more of a, a just a friendly UI to explore what else this layer can do and what it provides. Um, so, uh, I like this idea of selections. Uh, of course, you could have more than one thing. So far, you've just seen one. Um, I can also choose to, instead of clicking, if that's my main interaction, if you, instead you want to hover, uh, we can start hovering and uh, start getting uh, flagging new selections that we want. I could also just change that to an add instead. And then I start getting more and more and more. And it's sort of fun to do, but it's also visually overwhelming. Um, so uh, this is a good moment for me to sort of pause and talk about the animations since you see so many. Um, you can, if you are using animations, you can change the style of the animation or the, uh, the, the equation that's used. So if I switch to linear, it's just a constant rate of change over time. I can also instruct the layer to slow down the animation by increasing the duration. So I'll do that as well. And of course, I can just turn it off altogether. Uh, so if I want to sort of uh, return to where I was, since this is uh, neat to see technically but visually overwhelming, um, I can change my selection style just to be new. So uh, to sort of reset it back to where it was. So I think it, it sort of shows that there's a lot, um, a lot available to you in your use cases and how you, how you may end up using this yourself with your own data sets and how um, complex or simple they may end up being. Uh, so, one, another really cool thing I think I'm sort of excited about is that we also flip the lines depending on where you are around the world. Um, the reason we did this is we didn't, want to have the, we didn't want to have to deal with line exiting on one side of the monitor and coming in on a totally different side of the monitor. Uh, it's optional, so if you're developing this and using it, you can turn that off, but uh, it's, it's sort of neat if you have a totally different focus around the, focus around the globe. Uh, another neat thing, since you've seen this one-to-many relationship, is if your data is structured slightly differently, like a many-to-one, we also support that. So I'll zoom in and I'll choose that. I'll zoom back out. And with the animation on, uh, just trying to illustrate what that means. So if you have many origins actually coming into one destination, uh, that works as well. So. Uh, one to one is also supported, so maybe your data is not so complicated or has just more, you know, flat kind of structure from an origin to a destination point. That works as well. So there's a lot going on here. It's pretty. We try to make it uh, pretty flexible. You can also change the symbology of the origin points, the destination points, the busy occurs themselves, and the animations. Um, yeah. So with that, I think I'll hand it back back to you, Sarah. All right, um, so now that Jacob's shown you how the layer works, I'm gonna highlight some good use cases for the Canvas flow map. The Canvas flow map layer is great for showing the connection of start and end points, and the animation helps indicate the flow direction. It works well for getting a complex story of flow into an almost infographic geodata visualization for a quick comprehension of the system. But if it's important to show actual routes, you're probably gonna to wanna to use a road network or a flight network method instead. Um, but if you want to show Bezier curves instead of actual literal routes, um, and you have, but cardinal direction is important. For example, if it's important to show 
your flow started in Seattle, went over the Pacific Ocean to Tokyo, you're going to want to turn off that wraparound canvas method that Jacob just showed you and do some additional coding that we haven't built in yet. And the final thing I want to say, because we get a lot of questions about this, is does this work in 3D maps? And so 2D maps are, again, an abstraction of our 3D world, obviously. Uh, but by choosing to step closer to realism by mapping in 3D, the, cap the capacity to use abstract data viz becomes more difficult in some cases. And then the shortest distance between your two points is essentially geodesic lines. So you might as well use that in 3D. Um, but I would even argue that for flow maps with a global data set, you 2D is a better choice because if your start and end points are on opposite ends of the globe, this, the connection can be obscured by the 3D-ness of your map. And so now for some samples. And I have to read this so I don't get it wrong. So less than two weeks ago, a man named Camilo Cruz tweeted that he was using the Canvas flow map layer to visualize patterns of displaced people in Colombia. And since this is a very important topic that does not receive a lot of attention globally, I asked Mr. Cruz if he would allow us to share his work with you today. He said, sure. And a couple days later, he sent these beautiful animated GIFs. I wish, I wish they were, you could see them better and it was a bigger screen because they're really beautiful. He did a great job, um, incorporated a lot of uh, graduated symbology. Um, so a description of his, his, the human spatial issue that Camilo is mapping comes from the Center for Spatial Research. Over the, over the course of the last 30 years, almost 7 million Colombians have left their homes and towns in search for safety. This mass migration, with its dense network of specific and often hyperlocal causes, forms one part of the much larger global story of human beings on the move, mostly from the countryside to the city. And one final example I think we have time for is, oh, can we zoom out? All right. So we found this one quite interesting. When we first released the flow map, um, Scott Rothberg got in contact with us. And um, he actually, he's a, he's a PhD student. He, he graduated with his PhD. He defended successfully last spring. Um, this, ass was, this app was built by Scott Rothberg during his PhD work at the University of Florida. Scott put a grid over the state of Florida and then allowed the centroids of that grid to be this map's starting points. This, the intermediate endpoints where these the grid centroids lead to are the U.S. Forest Service field unit area offices. And so this in illustrates the connected relationship between any space in Florida where a prescribed berm would be authorized and that space is authorizing field unit. And then Bezier curves then connect those area offices to the main office in Tallahassee. So this is a really interesting illustration of the complex network of the prescribed fire policies and activities in Florida. And that wraps up our talk and we're ready for questions. <laughs>